So what show number is this? 18, I think. 18, show number 18. Yes, yeah. we've got, uh, got to work through it quickly because it has to be uploaded for today. All right. Um, I'm doing a uh, rather extensive PowerPoint and uh, although this will refer to it, the PowerPoint is so detailed that you actually have to go look at it on our YouTube. And uh, we will start off uh, talking about some things I never wanted to talk about, but uh, to a certain extent I am trapped by that circumstance of my life. And basically um, it is my first wife, uh, as I've said many times, that um, she was the town harlot and, uh, of Lithgow, a small town out of Sydney, about 90 miles. And uh, I knew her, um, what she looked like, where I had to go, what, where she would live, uh, the type of person she is as a child. Because uh, although it's hard to believe from the modern standpoint, uh, the Hindis are correct in the sense of uh, uh, present, past and future has happens all at the same time. That's what prophecy is all about. Because if you are making a prophecy of something, it is the vision of that person like John on the island of Patmos, he had a vision of revelation and that's what's going to happen. However, uh, the Bible being a satanic uh, control um, makes it appear holy when the book of Revelation, for example, is 99% uh, of it is rubbish uh, because it is contrary to the Essene scriptures, which are the oldest religion goes back to the Vedas and that goes back to Enoch. So the Great Pyramid is 7,000 years old or so and it was built before the Flood. And um, as you know, uh, those of you who are familiar with our work, uh, we had to go to the Pyramid on a certain date. Now, it, although you might not understand it, I understand it. That's the whole point. And the devil understands it. <clears throat> so basically what the Bible has done is uh, misdirected uh, people and now you've got 36,000 different denominations in the Protestant world which is primarily caused by the Catholic Church but the Catholic Church itself is the church of the earth because it is the one under uh, most attack and that's the one that was uh, killing people, burning people at the stake because they've been infiltrated by the devil and uh, men in high places uh, always uh, seek to do evil so wherever evil is it'll go to the highest command points. So, for example, the Queen, uh, Prince Philip, Charles. Charles is proud of being descended from Badly, the Impaler, for example. Um, we've got uh, all the generals in the uh, um, working for the Pentagon, Australian government, same thing. Matter of fact, our Prime Minister, who is a Jesuit, is over there in uh, socking up to Obama. And... Um, it is relentless. So um, <clears throat> I had to marry this, this woman. The shop I met her in was a coffee shop after a dance. My brother led me there because he was uh, from the den of iniquity. And he actually sat me down beside her. I wanted nothing to do with her because I, it was just a horror memory of what has to happen. The uh, shop later, in later years, I went back with a GPS and I measured the height above sea level and 3168 feet to ground level, which is Lord Jesus Christ, which is rather ironic. <clears throat> and the distance from that shop to where she was raised was 11.626 uh, kilometres. That's your width of the antechamber of the Great Pyramid. And all these things, I just know where to look because it's a memory. And it's a memory I, at night, uh, Ash will verify this, that I have great difficulty sleeping. I have constant uh, uh, bad memories that uh, haunt me. And I'll give you an example of one. Um, Eileen and I, after Tracy was born in Port Alberni, when I was 8,880 days old, etc., I'd married Eileen when I was 11626 weeks old, 11626 weeks old which is 22.28 uh, 
years, which is the height of Mount Kosciuszko, the highest mountain in Australia, and it goes on and on and on. We were um, in Zambia, and uh, I had bought a, uh, a ticket in a lottery while waiting to go from uh, Rhodesia into North Rhodesia, which is called Zambia, and uh, waiting for a permit and a friend of ours to pick us up at the uh, uh, Victoria Falls on the Zambezi River. And uh, the, there was one space missing and then the rest were filled in below that. So I took the space that was missing and it ended up winning a thousand pounds in the lottery in Rhodesia. Now that a thousand pounds would buy a Jaguar car in those days. So what's a Jaguar car worth today? 130,000. So give you some idea what kind of money it was. And uh, in order to get the money, um, I had to immigrate into Rhodesia because there was a cold war on between uh, Zambia and uh, Rhodesia itself under white rule was uh, Ian Smith and a uh, very nice man. And uh, the country was being manipulated by the Americans and the British to put it into the hands of the blacks which were incapable of running um, a tuck shop in a, uh, in a school. Whereas they wanted to run all the uh, industries and they made uh, a lot of um, money out of it, of course, America and England. But the idea is to cause as much havoc as you can in the world because this is how the British operate and they get the Americans to do the, the nasty bits. So. Um, I was working for a company there, uh, nine hour days, and uh, I was away from the house for well, the, the caravan. For you Americans, a caravan in, in Africa is uh, like a, a trailer. So I had this trailer I built and I hauled with this Jaguar car I had down from Zambia into Rhodesia. I was in Salisbury, Rhodesia. So I was staying in a trailer park. Now, a lot of people, youngsters in particular, on tour of Africa would come up from South Africa, go up through through uh, uh, Rhodesia and then go to Malawi or Kenya or somewhere like that in their trips. Well, this was a very, very uh, convenient area for my wife at the time because um, any young fellow that should go there should put the word on, next thing they're in the, in the camper, in the trailer, and she'd be shagging them, all right? So uh, this is how she was, and the neighbors in other trailers would tell me what was going on. And this particular day I come home and my daughter, she's only less than two years of age, she was tied to a tree. And uh, Eileen was inside the camper, exhausted from shagging all day with all these young tourists that were going through. And uh, I just lost it. I, uh, although I knew what she was doing, I, uh, it was the, if you're in Africa, a python bloody snake can come out the bush and wrap around a kid and, and swallow it, right? So here's my daughter tied to a tree in the hot sun. So I said, that's it. I said, yeah, I saw you out here. So uh, we took, uh, she agreed that if I paid for her fare back to Australia, she would leave me with the child. So I thought, well, hell of a good deal, good idea. Because I could stay in Africa and I could hire a, uh, a, a local woman um, and uh, she would come look after the baby and uh, I would do my work and so forth. So I go into a lawyer's and uh, we get the agreement drawn up and while we're in the waiting for the drawn, uh, agreement to be uh, drawn up so we can sign it, uh, we went into a small cafe and there was a couple of young fellas in there and uh, they seen her and I walked back in and of course these young fellows would walk up to her and I walk in and uh, being hot, she's wearing a low cut top and all the, this area of her chest would go motley pink when she was caught and I'd seen it many times before uh, and these are some of the guys that she's been in the sack with. So uh, we moved to back to Australia and uh, I've got a little girl I've got to take care of. There's no welfare in Australia at that time. And uh, I went and see my mother and I said, look, uh, Anna and I have gone out separate ways and uh, I've got this at your granddaughter. And 
she would have nothing to do with me. She said that uh, she was too old to be looking after little children. I said, look, all I want to do is get a job so I can work at night and then uh, I can take care of the baby during the day, right? So I went and said, this a friend of mine and uh, Marius Kipranetti is a Greek fellow and uh, we've been school friends together and uh, good mates. And uh, he said he'd look after the baby for me because he had a shop, like a fish and chip shop, sort of type of thing. So that was fine, that, that worked for a while. And I was working night shift, so I'd, I'd work all night, uh, be awake, then I'd take the baby during the day. And uh, of course I was getting no sleep. And this went on for quite a while. The baby would go over and see, I'd take her over to uh, my sister-in-law's and give the baby to her and Eileen would come there. This particular day, um, I go to pick the baby up and the baby's not there. So I'm tired, exhausted, hadn't been with any women of course. The next thing, she puts a word on me and seduces me, right? Like, big mistake. So I, I felt like a dog afterwards. As it turned out, she tells me a little while later that she's pregnant. Now the chances of me being the father was doubtful. However, uh, the possibility it was, I said, okay, get back together and we go to Canada, go back to Canada. Explain why you couldn't stay in Australia. Well, because she'd had so many lovers, no matter where we went, there'd be some guy giving her the wink and she'd be giving her a nod back and forth. It was amazing. Uh, we're talking hundreds. Not just a couple of guys down the street, right? Hundreds. And in my case, because of who I am, uh, this is accelerated. No matter where we went, these these guys would be showing up. It was very extraordinary. So I felt, well, at least if I get back to Canada, um, there I can build a house and in a small town, and she can be semi-isolated because. You can't have the type of things you're doing in Africa uh, and the child will be watching this, you see. So who knows whatever happened during the, the time I was there, whether the child was always tied up to a tree or sitting in the crib watching these lovers of this harlot and all the performance that he put on. So as, as much as it grieved me, and I, I still have nightmares over it, I thought the angels keep urging me to do what I've got to do. So without the going back to Canada, uh, my third daughter would not have been born because I got to a point where uh, I was so uh, distraught with what she was still up to that uh, I thought the only thing I got out of this marriage was the uh, children to which I adored. And uh, even though the second one might not have been mine, I thought, well, a little baby girl, anyhow, what difference, you know? So uh, the third child comes along, because I, I said to Eileen, I said, listen, either we have another child, or I'm, that's it, we're out here. I'm, you and I are separate. And I, so I couldn't stand it any longer. I had enough money at that time where I could have done that. So, between the third daughter and uh, the first daughter, the houses I built in Canada, the distance between the two is 444.3 kilometres, which is how many times the word God is found. It's 444.3, so 4443 is how many times the word God is found in 3877 uh, verses where the word God is found in the King James Bible, 1611 only. All, since I've been in, uh, revealing all the stuff that's been Tremendous amount of changes to the Bibles. That's why Rupert Murdoch, who was a Jew, uh, owns the NIV, for example. And every religion that uh, pops up, that is, uh, think they're, they're better, like Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they're better than the King James Bible, not realising that the King James Bible was put together by William Shakespeare, or rather the editing by William Shakespeare, Edward de Vere, his name was, the 17th Earl of Oxley, and King James, who was the first king anointed upon the rock of the stone, which is the ancient blessing rock or stone of destiny, 
that have been handed down from ancient times. You can read about it in Genesis 28, 11. So, if the first daughter had not been born in Port Alberni and I built a house, and the third daughter born in Port Alberni and I built a house, the distance between the two would not have been the same numbers as you'll find when you go into the Great Pyramid, which is the altar to the Lord, as I said, built by Enoch and his descendants uh, prior to the flood. Uh, in it is the antechamber, 116.26 pyramid inches wide. So my first wife, 1162.6 weeks old when I married. And then my third wife, which is Michelle, that came many years later, 1997 onwards. Uh, the difference in age between the two was myself and her in days was the same number, 1162.6 days. And then my eldest daughter and her youngest stepdaughter, rather my stepdaughter, her youngest daughter, is uh, 11.626 years. So there's your three parts of the antechamber of the Great Pyramid. Um, only one remains and then the slots where the other ones were in this antechamber, which we went to, by the way, as you know, some of you know. Um, and that's the day I had the 11 heart attacks because they tried to kill me because I already announced that I had to be on there on my mother's birthday when she would have been 101 years old had she lived. And the stars were telling a story and I'll, I can get into that and show you what that is later on the PowerPoint. Now, the second daughter, Charmaine, beautiful baby, my daughter, irregardless of the fact that I might not have been the father, she didn't look like me. I got blue eyes and uh, she doesn't. Uh, my first child and my last child, blue eyes. And uh, there's many features about Charmaine, especially as she grew older, that she didn't look anything like me at all. So I thought, oh, well, whatever. Loved her just the same. Now, it turns out, as I said before, had she not been born, uh, we would not have gone back to Canada to avoid all these lovers that would pop up all over the place. I mean, I couldn't leave this woman alone for five minutes. You, you've got no idea. Tell about your, your business, the, the phone. Oh, well, what, yes. Well, this is came after we went back to Australia. The children had grown up somewhat. And uh, I had a business, it was doing quite well. I was building a new house again. Because I, I had horses for the children and all the things that a father should do for the, the kids. So uh, we ended up with four horses and which had an adjustment which you got to pay for. And, uh, and you know, veterinarian and all that kind of stuff and horses, saddles and bridles and a trailer to cart the horses around in blacksmith, and blacksmith all that, <laughs> right? So, uh, this particular situation was expensive, and I found that I was getting less and less work. And although I'd spend a thousand dollars on advertising a month in the newspapers, I was getting no work. So after uh, a while, the phone, when I was working in the, because I had nothing to do, I was building machines in the, in the garage, a uh, double garage, which I had a lathe in there, I built machines, welding machines, so forth. And I was building these, what's called roll formers for making gutters and making siding and all sorts of things like that for houses. But it's sake, getting no work. So the phone would ring. Yeah, hello, yeah. Have you got any angle aluminium? No, I haven't. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Because I was in the phone book run. I was getting two or three phone calls a day. Have you got, do you have flat bar aluminium? Do you have this? Do you have that? All the stuff I don't have. So I started to think, wait a minute, something strange going on here. So when someone would ring, have you got any aluminium uh, in um, angle? Yeah, heaps of it. How much do you want? Then it would go silent, right? So uh, these are guys that she had been having an off with, right? So I hired um, 
uh, a detective agency, Pilkingtons. And this uh, private uh, detective came out and he said, well, we'll put a bug on the phone. Because I told him, I said, listen, I'm losing money hand over fist here. I've got lots of responsibilities, lots of, lots of things I've got to pay out. But advertising just not working. So, uh, also I used to get repeat business. I'd do a job, I always do good work, and I'd be recommended. So a lot of my work would come through recommendations, but I wasn't getting into those either. They all dried up. So as it turned out, uh, he put a bug on the phone, and the phone had a six hour tape. So a couple of days later he comes back, as they do, and he checks out the tape. So he comes around to see me, he said, look, I've listened to things in my lifetime. I said, he said, I've never heard such filth in my life as what your wife is doing with all these lovers that she got you, this endless. She said, in one day they, she used up six hours of tape on the phone. I said, right, now we're into it now. Now, um, I fixed the phone up by putting a special phone in that uh, she couldn't dial out on or dial in from uh, because I re got a new number and done all sorts of things which the, the detectives told me how to, to isolate it. For example, you could dial a phone and some numbers wouldn't dial up unless you have a key to open it. So let's say you was going to dial 9437824. Well, the 8 wouldn't show up or the 2 wouldn't show up on the phone. So you only dial out six numbers. So, uh, not the eight. So this is the kind of things I had to go to to stop her phoning out and then people phoning in. And uh, also because uh, uh, of what was also happening at the time, and I was very, very tired because I'd work around the clock. Uh, if I wasn't working in the house, I'd be uh, working on the new house I was building. And um, I come in one day and this fellow I knew from the horses out at where we uh, had, he had three daughters and my three daughters used to ride the horses together uh, at a farm, a distant farm. And he said, you better look in to see what Tracy's doing. This is the oldest daughter. I said, why? So he said that uh, she's going out with this guy that's just been arrested and uh, he was the leader of a, uh, six guys at Pack Rape and Woman in the National Park, which wasn't too far from us. It's a lovely park actually, but didn't have any pleasant memories for me. And what happened was this woman had a small van and uh, she uh, was sleeping in it overnight when these six assholes uh, got drunk, come across her, smashed the window, dragged her out and raped her all night. She eventually managed to get away and ran off in the bush and so the next day the rangers uh, found her, or she found them, and um, the six guys are arrested. So this is Tony and he tells me this. And Tracy was now, after all this, lined up with this guy and that was the uh, boyfriend and Tracy was uh, a kid that you couldn't do anything about in the sense of um, for example she a beautiful girl blonde um, blue-eyed lovely suntan lovely skin and she'd just wrap a sheet around and put a safety pin in and walk down the bloody streets like he's half naked it was an unreal so if this is not coming from me I can assure you so uh, I drive up, up the driveway and Eileen, she's in the middle of the driveway doing something or other. And as I pulled in, I got out of the truck and I walked up her. And I said to her, do you know about this guy that Tracy's going out with? This guy that's been out on bail, charged with pack raping a woman? She said, yeah. And I said, why the hell didn't you tell me so I could do something about it? And then she said something which I still have nightmares over. She said, you're such a good man, you'll do anything for anybody. I wanted to get even. So I thought that's it. So uh, 
We drew up an agreement. I said, now you can go out, do what you like, whatever. Go out three nights a week, whatever. Be honest about it, I don't care. And I'll go out and get myself a girlfriend as well. That's it. So we agreed to that. I said, we'll stay together in, in the house. I'll keep on paying for everything. You don't interfere with we'll let me earn some money so we can keep your lifestyle. I said, but that's it. I said, I can't have anything more to do with him. Can't put up with it anymore. So I told the kids. Charmaine was upset. However, I said, look, I'm still here. But your mother, she wants to go and do what she likes. I didn't tell her what, the, what she was doing. Tell the kids what she was doing. I just kept it as it, as it was. So uh, that was fine for a while. I'd go out with my mates, uh, a buyer in his name, mother went to school with him, and he had just got divorced. And uh, we'd go out playing snooker or pool or something like that. I wasn't really interested in chasing women. I had none in my lifetime, I didn't have a lot of luck with women, so I wasn't going to be looking for one of those again. So, uh, as it turned out, he wants to join Parents Without Partners, which is, which is fine. Uh, I don't recommend it because the people who go to Parents Without Partners are all divorced and got kids. They've either caused a divorce or they've been divorced and they're damaged goods. So, from that point of view, it's not a good idea, I don't recommend it. Anyhow, uh, I go with him this night to what's called the Bankstown RSL, Returned Soldiers League, and they've got a big hall there. And the Returned Soldiers Leagues are all over Australia. Uh, they got, they're like mini Las Vegas, you know, gambling and, and slot machines and all that kind of stuff. So I walk in and uh, Byron was beside me and we got about three feet into the door and the angel spoke to me and said, marry that one. I said, what? And I looked up. Marry that one. Same voice I've heard many times in my lifetime, which has always got me into trouble. But as it turns out, it was divine things that had to be done. So I thought, no bloody way. I'm not doing it. Well, Byron is sort of a handsome young fellow, and he, he uh, I want to say young, 45, and uh, he was very nearsighted and didn't want to wear glasses because it didn't look cool, right? So he'd say, what's that one like over there? I'd say, oh, she's a good sort, yeah, okay. So off he'd go and as he got closer, he could sort of view the woman up close and she looked all right, so then he started dancing. Well, he shows up with this one, this particular, that night. And... Uh, Turns out she was a local harlot from a little place called Penrith, but he was a, a man that was into all sorts of obscenities, and, uh, which I later found out about. Catholic boy. And um, who's the friend of this woman that he says, oh, we've got to go sit this, at the same table with this woman, right, that he'd been dancing with. So I said, oh, okay, reluctantly. And I walk over there, and there's this woman sitting there, and he's sitting with her, and I sit down beside her. And next thing, this woman, the angel said to me, get married that one, she shows up and she's sitting at the bloody same table. So I thought, oh shit. Well, next thing, he's arranging a four of us to go out on a date, go for Chinese meal, this type of thing. Well, I didn't want to go around. Right? Everything I tried to, to avoid, there she was. It was extraordinary. So, as it turns out over time, she becomes my second wife. Now, she's having a baby. So, we go to this lovely man, obstetrician, and uh, he assured her and myself that he'll be there right through the whole thing, no problem, right? So, when the baby has got a week to go, he gets called away and is replaced by a fellow, like, I think they call him a locum, but he'd come down 600 miles from a place called Tweed Heads where my uncle, who uh, had told me all about the Golightly family and how he should have been king and what's got a bullshit, he's a real arsehole, this guy, my uncle. And um, 
this sort of got me re-interested in the uh, royal line of the family because his marshals were also of the same king. So uh, this doctor shows up. We go in and my wife in the last seven days was feeling sick, morning sickness. So we go and this doctor, he's, he's looking at me and he leans back, this, this monster, and he leans back into the shadows and he's looking at me, right? And I said, this star guy's like got a demon, right? So uh, I, I can sense this sort of thing, right? So he starts to write a, a prescription out for Pauline. I said, don't take these pills, I'm telling you, this is bad news. She took the pills and the baby died. That's probably one of the most heart-wrenching things I've ever experienced. I, I wouldn't, uh, it's unexplainable. And uh, my whole chest froze in, in a crushed, almost like a heart attack. As it turns out, uh, that baby, um, eight, eight, eight weeks pass, and by that time I'm with Michelle, who was the reincarnated Mary Magdalene in uh, Victoria, uh, Melbourne, and the, the house that she had inherited from her mother, her mother lived at 666 uh, Main Road, Eltham, right? and this woman, straight out of hell, you got no idea. However, I'd never met her, but I knew of what I was told about her by Michelle the things she used to do. The house that Michelle had inherited was a small, it wasn't really a house, it was a separate unit, if you like, a uh, condominium. And it was pretty well run down. And uh, I go over there this particular night after meeting her at a dance where what happened was I went to Rembrandt's which was a dinner club for over 29s, right, with my brother. Again, not to meet people. My brother wanted to go because he met it, wanted to meet a woman. And uh, he ended up finding a woman and he didn't go no more, but I started going there because she could get a meal and listen to the music, it was very pleasant. And then uh, after about nine o'clock or so, the youngsters would start showing up and then the rock music would start and I'd leave, right? Well, Michelle used to go there all the time. She dressed very well. It's an excellent ballroom dancer. And uh, I thought, I'm not going to get sucked in again. As it turns out, I'm sitting there on the edge of the dance floor and she used to dance with two or three very good ballroom dancers, mates, friends. She always came alone, always went home alone. So she looked like a, a, a decent sort of lady. And I'm sitting there, all of a sudden I'm lifted up out of my seat as the dance had stopped between numbers and up behind her, grabbed her by the shoulders, turned her around and sort of had her in the head like it's the next dance, she said, yeah, swung her back again. I thought it was pretty cool as shit actually, but as it turned out, we were dancing from then on, we, we got on very well. But so the first night they actually went out for a dance, uh, we went to see Jurassic Park of all things. And um, the, the, I had this little Volkswagen car and had a flat tire. No jack, but I had to think for taking the tyre off. So I un undone the bolts on it, and then I lifted the car up, and she slid the wheel onto the nuts, and then I put the nuts back on, on the, to the screws, the bolts. So she was quite impressed by that. Not many people can lift vehicles. So I take her home, and they're sitting in this uh, uh, run-down condo, and uh, her daughter comes in. Her daughter's a big girl, five feet ten inches or so. So uh, she walks up to her mother, and just to belittle her mother, she started poking her on the head like that with a finger. Well, my instinct was to knock her out. But at that point, after this poor woman, she's got to put up with this asshole. So I become interested in that because of that fact. And as it turns out, uh, we end up, uh, I got sick one day and uh, I couldn't move. So I laid on the couch and of course the daughter lived there, you see. And uh, three days I was like that. As it turned out, uh, she said to me, why not stay? 
because I did have a protection of her from this daughter, this monster. Now, as the monster turns out to be born on the 20th of December in Geelong, Australia, and the sunrise to sunset was 888 minutes, you got the Jesus thing happening again. And also, Michelle, when I did all the numbers on her, because I, this is what I do, she was 1162.6 days younger than I, and that's your antechamber number of the Great Pyramid. Uh, but she turns out to be, this Rhiannon, turns out to be 11.626 years younger than my eldest daughter. So I can see the pattern. Right. So this is what uh, how it kicked on from there, which is fine. Now, as it turns out, she has a daughter, and uh, Rhiannon, has a daughter. Rhiannon has a daughter, and uh, she says to me because she used to to uh, read my writings like uh, I'd watch her sometimes and through the window. And she'd be in there reading my stuff and she thought I couldn't see it. And uh, she said to me, if you're Christ, tell me that what they all, what it, people want lotto numbers or something like that. If you're Christ, tell me when the baby's going to be born. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, I said, the, uh, she'll be born at 8.53pm on the 11th of August, 2001. Well, on that date, she shows up because she, by that time, moved out with her uh, de facto. And uh, she said to me, it's 11, the baby's not here. So I said to her, this is about four o'clock in the afternoon. I said, the day ain't over yet. So they get in the car and they're driving back out to where they live on a farm and her water broke. And she goes into the hospital and has a baby at 8.53. So Jade, the uh, de facto, he looks at her and they're looking at her and little baby and lovey lovey dovey. He said, oh shit, he's right. Exactly on time. Right? So you would have thought that would have made a bit of difference to the, to the family when I could do that sort of thing. But no. As it turned out, uh, Rhiannon uh, is not a motherly type, she's a dictator. And uh, she wanted to go to work. Well... I wasn't working at the time, and uh, I was doing a lot of studies and so forth, as you might expect. So I looked after the baby, and basically, as a little baby girl, I was the perfect man for the child because she was replacing what I had lost with my own children, and uh, I had time to to uh, educate her and develop her little personality into uh, the right, correct direction. And a uh, very close relationship because she called me Parky. Now the reason they called me Parky is that when I'd go from their house to the park, it was to go past where we lived with, where I lived with Michelle. So she could only, when they're driving that way, we're going to Parky, to the park. And as it turns out, uh, when she was dropping the baby off to go to work, uh, we're going to Parkies. That's what your little mind started to do when she learned to talk, right? So they call me Parky to this day. The next baby to come along was Trinity. Now the first baby, Alaska, she was uh, born when my mother, Daphne, had she been alive, would have been 88.8 .8 years old. And the date she was born on is the 222nd day of the year. I weigh 222 pounds, and there's 222 truths in the Bible, 222 wisdoms, etc. And uh, the word is Nazarene, I think. No, Alexandria. Wisdom. So, the next baby is coming along. So she says to me, if you're Christ, you can tell me what date this baby's going to be born on. I said, yeah, I can. But I ain't going to. She said, oh, of course you can't. I said, oh, yeah, I know exactly when that baby's going to be born. Right. Turns out it was 888 weeks also after I married Pauline. And also uh, when I was 69 years of age, she was 88.8 .8 years old, 8.88 .8 years old. She is uh, the mother, Miriam, Mary, 
reincarnate. Because my task in this life, and why would I live through this shithole, was to uh, show the, the intelligent, spiritually pure people of the world, and there ain't that many, I can assure you, um, that Christ is back in hell with you. Because that's the Apostles' Creed, that uh, on the third day he raises again from hell. Well, this is this is uh, hell is, is what it is. The crucifixion is three hours, saying it on a cross is nothing. Seventy years of, of, of torment, of all these kind of things that I've lived through, is what it's all about. So, uh, we get back to Shemaine. And I did the numbers on her the other day. If you, you haven't... You, you said to me in at other times that anything that you did on Charmaine meant nothing, it was nothing. So you, you knew that she wasn't yours. Yeah. Um, Until some, a conversation came up and something stuck in your craw and you started... I, we had read the uh, book of Revelation of the Essenes. Now I can be blinded to things too. Don't worry about that. But how I operate is... Uh, um, this here is, for, for example, we just printed it off, and um, the basically the uh, SM Revelation talks about the angels of the earth and the angels of heaven. And um, I'll give an example. And I opened the fifth seal. And I saw and beheld the angel of life. Between her lips flowed the holy alliance between God and man. And she knelt over the earth and gave to man the gift of creation. Now man can create. This is one of the things that uh, as Jesus, being an Essene, I had to go to the Jews because the Jews is where the evil is going to accumulate, right? And uh, being an Essene is... What I, I taught them was that their Bible, their, the Holy Torah that they call, was a load of crap. Right? So this didn't go over too well with the high priest, as you might understand. But I heard only the harsh discord of sadness and discontent. And he lifted up his sword and cut off the heads of the singers. And, turned, and then, it says, this is what John says, and I turned my face away in shame. So that is the... the uh, uh, overbearing uh, words of shame that comes out of the, the visions that John saw. It's got nothing to do with the 144,000 Jew virgins because that's written in by the Jews, right? So the people will look towards the Jews as being the chosen race and they're going to be the holy people and blah, blah, blah. So it's going to be the preaching of the 144,000 Jews that's going to convince the world, uh, and so on. Well, that's a load of crap, right? The Jews are the last people. So we get down to... Uh, this one here. And Ash can tell you how it all come about, but I'll, I'll read it. And I opened the third seal. Remember, the third day raised again from the dead. So the synchronicity of numbers, I'd read that and I'd see it in a different way that you would read it because of my personal life experiences. And I opened the third seal and I saw and behold the angel of the sun and between her lips flowed the light of life. The light comes from the sun. And she knelt over the earth and gave to man the fires of power and the strength of the sun entered the heart of man, nuclear fusion. And he took the power and made with it a false sun, nuclear reactors. And he spread the fire of destruction, burning the forest, Fukushima, laying waste the green valleys, leaving only charred bones of his brothers, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. See what I'm saying? So, we had read this before, of course, but um, I was kind of fixated on it, and this is what happens. And um, after a day of thought, I then looked into, again, 
because I wanted to prove that Shamaim was my child for her sake. Because all this is going to come out. The way her mother behaved, etc. It's got to, got to come out. As it turns out, the youngest child, who is 2.127 uh, years younger than Rhiannon, the child of my stepdaughter, the mother of Trinity in Alaska, the daughter of Michelle, who was Mary Magdalene. And that number in days is 777 days. That's the age Lamech was uh, in his lifetime. And of course the 777 number is the word, how many times the word city is found. And of course it ends up in the book of Revelation, which is fine. Because uh, there are parts of the Bible there. They sort of, the Jews, when they altered the Bible, they, they have to leave some of it in to make it look good, right? So the holy city. But the numbers was arranged by William Shakespeare, Edward de Vere, his real name, the 17th Earl of Oxley, and James, who was the anointed king of Scotland. And remember, if you know anything about Scottish history, the English regarded Scotsmen as being less than a dog. That's the Talmud influence, you see, because the English had been heavily influenced by the Talmud. So we've got seven, seven, seven days. So I thought, all right. So I'll do the English gematria. And that, what English gematria is, is you take each word, and I'll say, I'll read the first part, A-N-D, and, right? So that's a, a one, an N is a 14, a D is a four. So you add that together. I, which is a nine. Open, which is O-P-E-N-E-D. So that's a 15, a 16, a uh, five, a 14, a five, and a four. So add that together. So you do the whole uh, of that verse, and it comes out with the number 3907. Now only recently, within the last year or so, had I uh, been able to get hold of a program which was actually an astrology program to start with, and uh, it developed into an astronomy program. Now, astrology, don't look at it because it's stupid. It only applies to myself. And it's the Hindi astrology that you've got to look at when you're studying me, because you're looking at the heavens, and the heaven is the creator, so that's me. Come into hell to get you all out. So with it, you can uh, do things like measure from Jupiter to Earth, on any given day, and for example, when I was uh, born, the uh, measurement from Jupiter, why Jupiter? Well, it's uh, 88,800 miles across, that's your Jesus number in Greek geometry. And um, Matthew 123 has a value of 8880. That's the age I was when uh, my daughter was born in Port Alberni. Uh, the sunrise to sunset was 888 minutes. When she was conceived on the 29th of July, Jupiter was overhead for 888 minutes. Catch me. So, with this particular program being uh, advanced in uh, being able to measure things precisely, you can measure from Jupiter. Now, the, the stars that were seen by the ancients wasn't Neptune, you couldn't see it, wasn't Pluto, you couldn't see that. And uh, Uranus couldn't see that. All he could see was from Saturn in. And Mercury could only be seen at very early in the morning. Um, so uh, even that was difficult for trained uh, astrologers. We're not talking astronomers here, we're talking astrologers. And they could read these things and predict the date of the Star of Bethlehem because the constellations where these planets would line up in conjunctions or or a solar eclipse of the moon, all this kind of thing. Uh, it was all calculated by the ancient astrologers. And um, so I did those verses that I just read. That's the uh, third one. And I opened the seal and I saw and behold the angel was sun between. Okay, so this is applying to now because uh, it's talking about the sun, it's talking about nuclear fusion. It's talking about how man has taken it over, and it's talking about the Jews. It's not talking about Chinamen. It's not talking about Japanese. It's talking about the Jews. Right. 
and the Jews become the Zionists. So the Jews broke away from, and they're all Khazars. There's very, very few Jews actually still in existence because Khazaria had taken over, and they weren't. They were Mongols. They weren't nothing to do with with uh, Judaism at all. So most Jews that's in Israel today um, are not Jews, nor were they related to any of the ancestors that they call themselves Jews. So they've been gathered there to be murdered. And I can't get through to them because they're all too stupid, right? And where's it? Oh, here we go. Before we get back to that, this is um, two pieces of paper I just printed out. For eight minutes. So we've got eight minutes left. The uh, population per square mile is 717 people per square mile in Israel. And uh, the highest mountain is uh, 3963 feet. Uh, its highest point is Har Moron, 1208 metres or 3963. 3963 is uh, Patmos, where the island of Patmos where is also the radius of the Earth in miles. And that is where John had the vision of what's going to happen to Israel. Right. There it is there. And when the population reached 717, that word is Armageddon. Now, the Essene Revelation had a value of one I was just talking about as a value of 3907 in Gematria. The age difference between my youngest daughter and Shemaine is 6.66 years. There's your beast number. And the distance from Jupiter to all, on oh, this is the day she was born, the distance from measuring from Jupiter to Saturn, uh, Mars, Venus, uh, Mercury, the Earth, and the Sun is the same number as the value of this verse. Where is it? Where the nuclear. Son, and I opened the seal and saw and behold an angel of the sun between her lips flowed the light of life, the sunlight. And she knelt over the earth and gave to the man the fires of power of the sun and entered the hearts of men and he took the power and made it a false sun, nuclear fusion in Fukushima in particular. All of these things that are built throughout the earth are, have a Suknet virus in it. They are ready to be detonated. And that will take out the entire Earth if Fukushima is not bad enough. The uh, reality then is that I was blinded to reading the numbers of my second daughter. Even though I thought she might not have been mine, I was going to look after her as a father anyhow because she's still my child, irregardless of who the father is. As it turns out, then the numbers have to be that I am the father. Right? And even she thought, you know email that I got over a text or some sarcastic remark on one of the things I was doing. Uh, I only talked about the two daughters, I didn't talk about three daughters. And the remark was, you have three daughters, and of course it was coming from Ireland. So, uh, how are we going for time? Uh, five minutes. Alright, so uh, this is what it's all about. So, uh, Armageddon is, is where, uh, in ancient times, the Battle of Armageddon. That'll give you some references here. That say the Jews do not read the New Testament, they, they, but they do what, um, in their correct mind, worship the Father. And uh, although they don't know it's read, they've been uh, Lucifer all along. Now, Israel was is established by the Zionists by Lord Rothschild. On the 2nd of November 1917, which is my daughter's birthday, that's the youngest daughter, and she was born in 1977. Now, together for Armageddon. So this is what they're trying to do. If they can kill off all the Jews that are the ones, irregardless of where the genetics are, they are the one that Yitzhak Kaduri predicted that would be the ones that would recognise the Messiah who was Jesus. He died 108 years old. He was the most renowned scholar in Israel. And he predicted Jesus Christ, right? So, as it turns out, uh, we're running down to Armageddon of the Jews, right? Now, they have a very large, extensive nuclear development in Israel, and they're going to do them in with that. Demona. Demona. 
That's why Kennedy was killed. He wanted to look into it and uh, Ben Gurion, David Ben Gurion, had him assassinated. That's what it's all about. So you either wake up, and I can leave at any time, they can't get me, and Ash can leave, and all my saints that, that uh, we can go. Right. And the earth will be destroyed, and I'll start again with another one. As or man, we fix it. As a matter of fact, in, in, in this, if you, you read on further from there, and the angel gave to me the book, and I opened the book, and I read therein what had always been, what was now, and what would come to pass. And I saw the Holocaust that would engulf the earth and the great destruction that would drown all her people in oceans of blood. And I saw too the eternity of man and the endless forgiveness of the Almighty. The souls of men were as blank pages in the book, always ready for a new song to be there inscribed. So that is reincarnation. The new song to be inscribed on the blank pages of the book. Well, each one of us are a book when we are born to the earth. Blank pages and we inscribe the new song of each life upon the pages of our book. And I lifted up my face to the seven angels of the earthly mother and the seven angels of the heavenly father. And I felt my feet touching the holy brow of the earthly mother and my fingers touching the holy feet of the heavenly father. And I uttered a hymn of thanksgiving. And the, these are the words of John. I thank thee, heavenly father, because thou hast put me at a source of running streams, at a living spring in a land of drought, watering an eternal garden of wonders, the tree of life. Mystery of mysteries, growing everlasting branches for eternal planting to sink their roots into the stream of life from an eternal source. And thou, Heavenly Father, protect their fruits with the angels of day and night and with flames of eternal light, lighting every way. It goes on, it talks further about the judgment of, um, it challenges the one, it challenges John. But again the voice spoke and again my eyes were drawn away from the splendours of the realm of light. Heed thou, O man, you may walk on the right path and walk in the presence of the angels. You may sing of the earthly mother by day and of the heavenly father by night and through your being course the golden stream of the law. But would you leave your brothers to plunge through the gaping chasm of blood as the pain-racked earth shudders and groans under her chains of stone? Can you drink from the cup of eternal life while your brothers die of thirst? And my heart was heavy with compassion and I looked and lo, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Now, this is where he sees the Christ coming to the earth, and a woman clothed with the sun and moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of seven stars. This is all in the constellations. And I knew she was the source of running streams and the mother of the forests. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, and from his nostrils wafted foul and loathsome air. And where he rose from the sea, the clear waters turned to slime, and his body was covered with black and steaming stone. And the woman clothed with the sun reached out her arms to the beast, and the beast drew near and embraced her. And lo, her skin of pearl withered beneath his foul breath, and her back was broken by his arms of crushing rock. And with tears of blood, she sank into the pool of slime, and from the mouth of this beast there poured armies of men brandishing swords and fighting one another. And they fought with a terrible anger, and they cut off their limbs and clawed out their own eyes until they fell. 
into the pit of slime, screaming in agony and pain. I'll leave it there. We have to stop this recording. We'll continue with this. This is a good subject. Stop it with that again. Okay. Let's hope that as I turn. I have to get a stick. Joel's. We'll have to wake up Joel so he can get this up in there. Plug that red one in there, no? Should be my next space, I don't know. Well, I'll stop this one and we'll start again. <laughs>